Well hello Internet and welcome to my LISP video tutorial. In this one tutorial I'm pretty much going to cover everything you'd learn by reading a 400 page book on LISP and basically LISP is one of the oldest languages being that it was first created in 1958 except over the years it has changed quite considerably and it keeps getting better and better. Many people feel that it is a good idea to learn LISP because it actually will teach you how to program better and I personally think that that is indeed true. And in fact numerous capabilities that you find in pretty much every programming language out there actually was first created in the programming language of LISP. You probably know it's widely used in the field of artificial intelligence among many other different subjects and probably LISP's greatest strength is the capability to use data to generate code. So I have a lot to do so let's go over and look at how we're going to install this on both a Mac as well as Windows. Now if you're on Macs it's very easy to install Lisp. Just go to macports.org install.php and you're going to want to follow these little rules here. Install Xcode and then you're going to come down here and install the proper part of Mac ports depending upon whatever your operating system is. Then after you install that, which is quite easy, you're just going to go into a terminal and you're going to type in sudo port install C Lisp. That is it. You're done. And it's going to say all kinds of things like you should update and da 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 da. Don't worry about that. Just left that on there so that if you see all these warnings you aren't afraid of them. And that is all you need to do on a Mac. Now let's take a look at what we need to do on Windows. Now on Windows you're going to go to clisp.org right there and then you want to come over here and click on Win32. If you want to save yourself a little bit of time however you could just go to sourceforge.net and this is Project C Lisp Files Latest Download and you're going to want to download Lisp there. Then after you download it's going to allow you to set everything up. You're just going to click on next and then you're going to say I agree and then you're going to just leave everything the way that it is and click on next and it's going to say exactly where it wants to install this. Click on next. Just remember where that's installed in case you have to look that up which we will be doing whenever we are compiling our programs. Click on next and it's going to install Then after it installs it's going to put this little guy here on your desktop and you're just going to double click on that and it's going to open up this guy. Now on both the Mac and Windows and Linux and everything some people really prefer to use this. I am not going to use it in this tutorial because I want to be able to type a whole bunch of other description things out on the screen and that doesn't work very well here. But basically with this little program here you're going to be able to come in and do everything I do in this tutorial so if you feel more comfortable doing everything here do it here otherwise do it in a test file and then you will be able to compile. So now everybody has all that installed so let's go over and start writing some code. Okay, so I have a basic text editor here on the left side of the screen. And over here I have my terminal. If you're on Windows, it's going to be command line. And if I want to open up C Lisp, I just go like this. And you can see exactly the same things that we saw there whenever we were using Windows. And I could also come in here and I could just say print hello like that. And boom, you can see that it shot it right back out. You just wrote right there a Lisp program. And you're going to save your files with the extension .lisp. That is the extension we use with Lisp. And like I said, you can do everything in this command exactly like this, or you can go and do them otherwise. So I'm going to quit out of this, and this is how you quit out of it. And you can see it says bye, it's very nice. And we're going to come over here and write ourselves some programs. Now the first thing to remember, there's a whole bunch of different comments, and I'm going to be doing some things very few, but a couple things that are going to be styled in a not Lisp way so that it's easier for you to understand as a new programmer with Lisp. So I'm going to be doing things with parentheses sometimes that make the code more understandable but aren't Lisp rules. So if you want to put a comment that's going to describe your program, so at the top of your program, you're going to come in here and put four semicolons. That is a comment. And that is the only time you'll ever use four. For the most part, you're going to use three and this is just a basic comment and then we have additional rules. If you're going to put a comment that is indented with your code you're going to put two little semicolons and then put another comment and then if you're going to put a comment that comes after a line of code you're just going to put one. Also we have multi-line comments inside of Lisp and you're just going to put the number sign and two little or statements there and we could say multi-line and then we're going to put two or statements 
and then a closing number sign. So that's how we do multi-line comments. And that's pretty much everything you need to know about commenting inside a Lisp. I'm going to show you a whole bunch of different ways to output data. Basically, the thing that's a little bit odd with Lisp is everything's going to be surrounded with parentheses. So if we want to output text inside of our console over here or our terminal, one way to do it is with format. And if we type in T, that's saying that we want to use our terminal or whatever to print everything out. And here is a basic hello world. And if you want to throw a new line at the end of this, you just put tilde and a percent sign exactly like that. Save that, come over here. We can also use C lists to be able to come in and execute our programs if we'd like. And we can just type in C lisp. And like I said before, you do this inside of Windows. And remember, you just need to know where C Lisp is installed inside of your machine to be able to execute it. And you can see right there, Hello World prints out real nice. So that's one way to output text on a screen. Another way we could output text on a screen is by using print. And there's a whole bunch of these different things. And I'm actually going to show you here how to read input into your program and then provide custom output. So I'm going to say, what's your name? That's a print statement without a new line. And then we're going to be creating variables. Now, you can do a whole bunch of things with variable names inside a Lisp. You're going to be able to use letters. You're going to be able to use numbers. You're going to be able to use plus and dashes and underscores and multiplication equals even. You can do a whole bunch of different things. I think I got most of them here. But you can use all those different symbols inside of your variable names. And normally, letters inside of Lisp are all going to be lowercase, and that's because Lisp is not case sensitive. However, remember, you can't use white space in names because list items are going to be separated with white space. Now, if you're going to be defining a global variable, which we are going to be doing right here, you just do define variable, exactly like that. And global variables are normally surrounded by asterisks. And they don't need to be, but this is just a general rule so that you can spot a global variable if you ever see it. If you want to read data from your console, you would just put inside of here, read. And that's going to create a new variable called name, and it's going to read data from the console and store it in the variable called name. Why don't we just jump right in here? I'm going to do like a simple intro, and then I'm going to get into more detail then afterwards. Let's create a function, and to do that, you just kind of type in define function, and let's call this guy hello you. Remember, no white space inside of here for the function names either. And this guy is going to actually receive the name value. It's going to be passed inside of there. And then just to keep everything nice and neat, I'm going to indent this. Again, you don't need to do that with Lisp, but that's a good idea to do it. I'm going to put T inside of there, which says that I want to output to the terminal. I'm then going to want to put the name inside of there. So I'm going to put a tilde and an A. That's where the name value is going to go inside of there. And let's say I put a little exclamation mark, and then I can do a new line right like that, just like I did before. Go put name inside of there like that, and then close it off. This is something you're not normally supposed to do with Lisp. You're not supposed to go down here, but I'm just showing you exactly where that closes that off, as you can see right there. And in fact, if you see, if I put that parentheses there, you can see exactly how it's closing the top off, and it gave me a warning when I put too many parentheses on there. Another thing I want to do is, by default, Lisp is going to output all data in uppercase letters. If I want to set that so that it's going to instead only capitalize the first letter of something that it prints out, I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to say print case and I'm going to say capitalize. If I would want everything to be outputted in lowercase letters instead of putting capitalize there, I would put, well actually if I wanted to do uppercase, I would put upcase and if I wanted to do lowercase, I would type in down case. So this guy or this guy could easily go in here instead depending upon how you want your output to show on your screen. And then if I want to call the function hello you, I would just go hello you inside of parentheses and then I'm going to pass inside of here this name value like this. And if we execute that, you're going to see what's your name. I'm going to type in my name, and it's going to say, hello, Derek. Just so you know, if I come in here and I get rid of this, let's come in and do that. What's your name? And you can see it's all uppercase, so that's exactly what that does in that situation. You may have a couple questions about format and what's going on right here. Let me just show you. Whenever you have a tilde or an A, you know that the value of this is going to be transported and put inside of there. And that's just going to show the value wherever you put that little symbol. If you would put a tilde and an S, it's going to put quotes around that value. And then you could also add 10 spaces for the value with the extra space on the right by just putting it in like this. Or if you want the extra spaces to show on the left, you would just put in that little at sign there instead. And of course, you could come in here and change this 
and it actually makes more sense to change that because this is not a global variable and you're going to get exactly the same results just like that. Say hello Derek. All right, so we got all that cleared up. Now let's go and explore a little bit more. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things that make Lisp a little bit different than other programming languages. Let's keep this inside of here and then we'll continue thereafter. Now you're going to hear about things called forms. Basically a form is a list with a command function name at the beginning. And this would be an instance of that. If we wanted to add the values of 5 and 4, that's exactly how we would do it. And basically this right here is going to be the function name and this right here, these two numbers right here, are going to be the parameters or the attributes that are going to be sent to this value. And of course the output of this would be 9. Another thing that's interesting is that you're actually going to be able to nest your forms inside of forms. So let's say that I wanted to add a value and we wanted to add 5 and then I wanted to take another value and subtract it and have it be 6 and 2. Well I could do it just like that. So this would subtract 2 from 6 give me a value of 4 and then add 5 and 4 together which would ultimately give me a value of 9 as well. I know it might seem a little bit confusing using all these functions inside of functions but as you practice with it and just look at it it's going to eventually make a lot of sense. What you have to understand is basically everything is a list inside of Lisp. And all of these different individual pieces are going to be held inside of things called con cells or consecutive cells. So for example, if we would have plus and five and four like that, these guys are actually going to be in cells. And they're going to be like this. And this is where you may be able to see how by learning Lisp, other programming languages might be a little bit easier to understand. And you can see right there, all those guys are going to be inside of cells. And actually the last cell always is going to be nil, which also represents a value of false. It's used for many different things, but it's just a sign that the list has ended for this command that you want to execute. Now I already talked about how to define a variable. Let's just go in here and define another one. Let's say we have one that's just called number this and we're going to give it default value of zero. Well we could come in here then again and change the value for number just like going set f providing the name change it to six and there you are. So that's how we're going to be able to change and define our variable names. And as you're going to see here in a little bit you can also use something called let to define variables inside of a body and so forth but I'm going to leave that out for now. Now let's take a little bit closer look at format and exactly how we can use that to output data in different ways. So here's format and we're going to put T so it goes to the console and we could say something like number with commas automatically added in there and we could put a tilde sign followed by a colon and a D that is automatically going to throw in all of our commas that we would like and you can see that it automatically threw those in there there's a whole bunch of different things here why don't I just go and show you exactly how they work you'd also be able to come in here and print out pi with five characters just by putting a tilde and the number of characters you want to show here on our screen we could just save that and execute it Da, 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 da. a little bit of a mess let's throw in our new line so we can see this a little bit better this and now you can see there is the numbers being printed out with commas here you can see that we only have five characters one the period two three four here we're also defining the number of decimals by putting in a comma before the number of decimals and you can see there we got four and this guy will actually print out a percent I'm showing you pretty much everything here as well as this one's going to automatically turn the 10 into a dollar format so there's a whole bunch of different ways we can use format why don't we go and look a little bit deeper at different math functions we can use Okay, I automatically went in here and just to show you we already covered exactly how we're going to add these different values together and there is a final value. How we handle subtraction, how we handle multiplication, how we handle division. However you can see that this is a little bit weird because it's going to actually output the division exactly the way you see it. If you want to show decimals for your division you're actually going to have to have one of these be a float with a decimal and then REM as well as mod are both going to return the remainder of a said division. And you can see exactly how we're able to come over here and put in these different functions and exactly where they're going to go in each of those 
those situations. So pretty easy to format and automatically input all these different math calculations. Now let's go look at a couple more math calculations. Okay, and now you can see right here how we're going to be able to perform all these other different math calculations like square root and exponent of one, as well as log. And this is actually going to come out to a value of three because 10 to the power of three is 1000. That's how log works. Thought I'd just bring that up. Gonna get a little bit more into how we're going to be able to compare different values to see if they are equal or not. This guy's automatically going to pop out a value of true, as you can see right there. Floor is going to round down, ceiling is going to round up, max is going to give the max of the values that are passed into it, as well as minimum. We can actually check if a number is odd or if it's even. Nil is exactly the same as false. And we could also check if a value is a number. And you can see right here, null and nil and false are all exactly the same exact value inside of Lisp. And along with all these other different functions, of course, we're also going to have all of these other different things like sine, cosine, tangent, arc sine, da 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 da. So now why don't we jump over and actually look at equality and how that works inside of Lisp. Now basically, let's come in here and let's define a parameter. You can also define, you can do things in so many different ways inside of a list, but it's absolutely amazing. Well, let's define another guy here. Again, it's going to have the value of name, and I'm going to define it as a symbol in this situation. Then if I wanted to come in here and actually check for equality. So let's say that I say, I'm gonna use EQ in this situation. I'm also gonna use equal here in a second. So name and check that it is equal to itself, as you can see right there. And let's go and throw a value out here in a new line, of course. I could then pass in EQ and Derek right like that. And you can see if I execute it, that indeed those two things are true. Basically, you're gonna use EQ anytime you are going to be checking for equality in regards to symbols. Everything else is basically going to be compared with equal instead for the most part. So let's come in and just compare a couple of these different guys. Here you can see I'm doing a comparison between symbols, so that indeed can be done with just equal instead of EQ. And there you can see the output over there is nil or false. We're also able to check for equality between numbers, just basic old numbers with equal. Also going to be able to work with that with floats. Also going to be able to handle strings. And the only reason why I have this backslash inside of here is because I have a quote right there and I want to differentiate and say that that quote right here is in fact not this quote. And how we do that is with a backslash. And you can see that it also is going to verify that they are not equal, these strings right here, by putting nil out because this is a lowercase and that's an uppercase. Equality does pay attention to the case of the values. And we're also going to be able to check equality between list. And we're going to get a lot more into lists here in just a moment. If, however, you'd like to compare strings of any case and integers to floats, you could also come in and use equal p. And how that is set up is, let's go and do that. We type in equal p. And you can see right here, I'm gonna compare a float to an integer to check for equality. And to get that value, of course, we're going to type in equal p in exactly the same way. And then we can also do a comparison with our different strings, even though the case might be different. Again, I'm gonna put a backslash inside of here. Well, let's go and put a backslash here, and then another backslash with my name. And then here, whenever I'm actually checking the equality, I don't need backslashes, of course. And it's very good, see? Whenever I clicked on that, that automatically closed this little blue, and you're gonna see here, whenever I hit the next one, this is gonna light up blue. So come over here and watch over there, see? they both load up below. So it's pretty easy to get used to the parentheses and how they work. And you can see that even though the case is different in these strings, these come back as true. And you can also see that even though one of these is an integer and one of these is a float, this also comes back true. So there's a couple different ways of working with equality or checking for equality. Now we go in and take a look at conditionals. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here, first off, is I'm gonna define a parameter, and I could use define variable. We could just do the variable. It doesn't matter, both are going to work in exactly the same way. And this is gonna be a global, and I'm gonna give it a starting value of 18. Now you're gonna have a bunch of different relational operators. You're gonna have greater than and less than and greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, or just simply equal to. And you're also going to, there's going to be a way to use or check for not equal, which I'll talk about here in a second. Well, let's just stick to that and I'll get into the logical operators here in a second. Now, if I wanted to perform a if conditional, what I'm gonna do is say if, 
and then I'm going to say equal and then I'm going to type in the to the variable that I want to check against versus the value and the way this guy's going to work is it's going to perform the first thing here otherwise if that condition is false it's going to perform something else so I'm going to say something like you can vote otherwise if that condition is not true I'm going to come down here and say you can't vote so you can see there's no else inside of here it's automatically built in and you can either go and put your closing parentheses here or follow the rules of Lisp and put them right there. And you can see if we execute, you can vote pops up. So that's how we would use those different relational operators as well as how we would use if. If you would in fact want to check for not equal, it's actually pretty easy. All we're going to do is come out here, again put a parentheses, and we're going to put not, and then we're going to go like this, like that, and boom, you can't vote pops out. So that's how we would check for not equal to, even though not equal to is not a necessarily option. And of course, all this code is available in a cheat sheet format in the description underneath the video. Sorry, I didn't say that earlier. You're also going to have a whole bunch of logical operators. You're going to have and, or, and not. And you just saw not. And with those, you're going to be able to perform even more complex conditionals. You're going to put the and outside instead of in the center of these conditions, which might seem a little bit odd. In this situation, we're going to check to see if age is less than or equal to 14 and normally the and would be in here but it's in here not a big deal and then we're going to do another conditional check greater than or equal to age and 67 in this situation and then we're going to perform this if both of those are true and i'll say time for work otherwise else we could say something like work if you want and you can see there you go work if you want comes back something that would actually make more sense in this situation is if we would use the or statement however because basically we're looking for situation in which our age is going to fall in the middle which means that one or the other of these is going to be equal to each other however not the other one and to check for that we would just type in or instead actually you can see right here that it would make a little bit more sense to take this and put this up here and then go time for work right here right like that that would actually make more sense in this situation there you can see time for work pops back so that is different ways we can use our logical as well as our relational operators let's come in here and define a couple more of these guys define a variable and we'll have just a number and give it a value of two and there we go to find three different variables all with the default value of two to start out now you might ask yourself, well, how do we perform multiple different statements inside of an if? Because that's something that we're definitely going to want to do. By default, you're only going to be able to perform one of them. Well, you could do something like this and then num2. So you could say if num is actually equal to the value of 2. Then if you want to put multiple different statements inside of them, you're going to type in prog n like that. And you're going to define all the different things that you want to set. So let's say that you wanted to define or set the value of num2 to be equal to multiplication of num2 times 2 to do that. And then you could also change the value of num3, just making stuff up here just to show you different things. And let's say that that would be a multiplication of 3 in that situation. Well, we're then going to close off the prog n part. There you can see it closed off. And then here we can just do, we could do another prog n for the else, but here we'll just keep it simple and we'll just say something like not equal to 2 and then close as off. So that's how we'd be able to execute multiple different statements in a situation in which this is true or if we want to put prog n down here, multiple different statements elsewise. And just make sure that we would go in here and set these to set f and execute this. And you can see right here how the values changed because the original value of num was actually equal to 2. Another conditional operator is the case statement. Let's define a variable called age. It's going to perform a limited number of different options depending upon the value of a certain variable. So we come in here and define a function and we could say something like get school and it's going to be passed in age then we could say case age which is going to be the variable value we're going to be checking against we're going to check that the value is equal to five and in the situation in which it is equal to five we could say something like kindergarten and that would be output to the screen otherwise we could check if the value was equal to six and in that situation we would say first grade and then we could continue onwards and onwards but just to keep this simple I'm going to have the default if neither of these are true and you define the default with the word otherwise and in this situation I would print out and middle school 
And of course we could come in here and call this function by going get school and then pass in the value of age. And you can see kindergarten pops back. If you would ever want to put in a new line after the print like this, function you're going to use for that is just going to be T-E-R, P-R-I, that just puts in a new line, as you'll see whenever we go and put some more information here on a screen. And now let's take a look at when, which is basically going to allow you to execute multiple statements whenever a condition is true. And how you use it is just go when, and in this situation we'll check for age to see if it is equal to 18. When it is equal to 18, we're going to go set F and we're gonna define number three to 18. Come up here and just throw that in there. And then if we wanted to output information, you could say something like go to college, you are 18, close that off. And if we jumped up here and changed the value of age to 18, you're gonna see when we execute that, that it's gonna say go to college or 18. Another thing you can do is very similar, is it's called unless. It's basically the opposite of when. And we could say something like unless, and then we'll put something like not, leave that exactly the same. And we could just set this to 20 and say something random, something random. And you can see there something random printed out. So there's a difference between when and unless. Another conditional we have available is something called conditional. And it's very, very similar to the way that if, else, and elf is work in other different programming languages. To use it, we're going to say something like, let's define another variable. We have this be college ready. And let's give it a value of nil to start off. Then to use the conditional, we're gonna type in C-O-N-D. We say something like, if the age is greater than or equal to 18, well, in this situation, that is indeed going to be true. Well, then you can just go in here and tab in as much as you'd like. Say something like set F for college ready to yes. And then we can come in and put in anything else we'd like to do, such as format, and we could say something like ready for college, and then close that off. And now we would have our else statement, which we would be very used to in other languages. We could say something like, if age is less than 18, and we could just borrow this guy up here, copy that, tab in there, and then we could change college ready to no, and then say not ready for college. And then finally, we would have your default, which would be else, and this is basically be saying, if you get here, we'll just put a T inside of there for true. And by default, we're going to say something like, don't know. And in this situation, you can see ready for college pops up. So there's a ton of different ways to use conditionals inside of Lisp. Now let's go and take a look at how looping works. Now basically, loop is going to execute code a defined number of times for us. So we're just going to type in loop and hopefully you're getting used to the parentheses and we're just going to say loop for x from there's a whole bunch of these some of them are easier to understand than other ones or are more usable so in this situation we're going to loop from 1 to 10 and then inside of this we would define exactly what we want to do this as we iterate through our loop and in this situation we'll just do something like real simple like printing out the value of x and you can see it did just that we could also use loop to loop until a condition is met and then jump out of our loop and we could do something like well, let's just come in here and set a value of x a value of one and we could say loop and again print out the value of x and then we're going to increment the value of x each time it goes through here and how we do that is just with plus sign and x and one and then we could put our when statement inside of here which is going to jump us out of the loop and we could say when x is greater than 10 and then we could do something like return x and that would jump us out of our loop basically going to look like the same sort of thing as you can see right there could also use loop to jump through a series or a list of different objects you say for x in and then let's create ourselves a list. So we'll have Peter. We'll get a lot more into lists here in a second. List, I'm not saying list. Then we'd say do again, and we could cycle through these guys and print them out on our screen for ourselves. Close off that loop, Peter, Paul, and Mary, printed right out there on the screen. And we could also, we wouldn't have to start at one by any stretch of the imagination. We go loop for y from 100 to 110 do and then inside of here define that we want to print out all those different values as well and there you can see those printed out do times is another looping structure that is going to allow us to iterate a specified number of times and to use it do times and you're going to define y 
and let's just say I want to loop through here 12 times. There we go. And print Y. And there you can see it went from 0 the whole way to 11. Starts out at 0 by default. And as we go, I'm going to give you a couple more examples of looping, but that's pretty much all that you're going to need for the most part. So now let's go and take a look at consecutive cells or lists and how they work, because they are very important inside of Lisp. Now let's say that we want to link together two objects of data. How you would do that is by typing in CONS or consecutive. And here I'm going to work with some superheroes. So I have Superman and Batman. Okay, so there's some different guys that we connected together inside of this list. I could then create a list by actually using the list function. So you could say Superman, Batman, and Flash. And I could also come in here and add an item to the front of another list by using consecutive as well. So we go Aquaman, and here you can see is another list, Superman and Batman. Okay, so there's just some quick ways of working with those. And I'm gonna, be, of course, be able to store these different list items inside of any other variable, just like any other variable, so there's nothing that's particularly fancy about them. The one thing that is a little bit fancy is, let's say that I wanted to get the first item out of one of my lists. How exactly would I do that? Well, I would use a function called car. So let's go and create a list item here. Just to try to keep this simple, we'll have Superman, Batman, and Aquaman inside of our list. There it is. So car is going to give us the first value inside of the list. And if you execute this, you're going to see first is equal to Superman. It does exactly that. Now, if I would want to get everything else outside of the list, I would change this from an A into a D. And let's just change this to everything else and you're going to see now I get Batman and Aquaman but I do not get Superman. Now this is very important to understand how the differences between the D's and the A's work and I'm going to show you a whole bunch of examples so I guarantee you're going to get this. So now let's say that I want to get the second item out of a list. This gets a little bit more complicated but not so much. So let's say I want to get my second item out of my list and this is going to be Superman, Batman, Aquaman, Flash and Joker just so I can show you a whole bunch of these. Now if I wanted to get the second item out of the list, remember the A is going to give me the first item out of the list. Now what do I want? I want to get everything else if I want to get the second item. What I'm trying to do is get Batman. So what I'm going to have to do here is I want to get everything else. So I want to have a D right here, but then I want the first item in that new list. So what do I do? I put an A right there. And if I save that, you're going to see that Batman comes back. Now this is very important to understand what we want. We want to get everything else. If we want Batman out of here, if we had an A inside of here, that would give us Superman. So I want everything else. That's my first little block off. So I'm going to put a D inside of there. That's going to give me everything else. And then with this new list, I'm going to say that I want the first item out of that new list. And that's exactly how this works and how using these A's and D's inside of here allows us to grab specific data out of lists. Of course, if I would want to go in and get my fourth item out of that list, what would I want to do? Well, I don't want this. I don't want the Superman, so I want everything else. So that's going to give me a D. Let's get rid of that. Now in the next situation, I want the fourth item, which is going to be Flash. So I don't want to use an A here. I want to get this part right here. So what do I do? I put in another D. So now I stuck with Aquaman, Flash, and Joker. Well, I want Flash, so I want to ignore Aquaman. So I put in another D. And now I have Flash and Joker. I want Flash, so I put an A in right inside of there. And if I do that and execute, you're going to see that I grab Flash. It's actually not the third item in that situation. It would be the fourth item. All right, so that is how we're going to be able to traverse inside of lists. I put a little bit more emphasis on it than is necessary, but I just wanted to guarantee that you understood exactly how this work. If you would, however, want to come in here and get the Joker, sadly, you're not going to be able to come in and, and type in another D. You're only allowed to use four of these different characters inside of your list. So, and I'm going to show you other different ways to traverse and grab data out of lists here as we continue. Just wanted to show you that example, and then actually in the description there's a link, and it has numerous different examples if you're at all confused with how to work with lists inside of Lisp. Another thing we can do is we could actually check to make sure a list is a list. So let's just change this to, is it a list? And how we would check it is with list P, and of course this is going to be a list, Batman and Superman. And you can see right there, it comes back as true. We're also going to be able to check if, for example, three would be inside of a list. So we say, is three in list? And then we'll come in here and change this up a little bit. Instead of list P, we're instead gonna say if member, 
and we're going to say what we're looking for inside of the list and then we say two four and six and then here we will provide a situation or an else in which they would not be true and you can see it comes back as nil you're going to be able to append or join together lists with the command append so you can say just some random words we're also going to be able to push an item on the front of a list so let's say we go define parameters nums and let's create a list inside of here and we wanted to push on to the front of our list the value of one onto nums that's how you would do that and then if we wanted to be able to get pretty much any value inside of our list we could go format and then what we would be looking for is the nth item which we want the second item out of the list called nums and you can see the second item in the list is four. A couple other different things we can do with the lists inside of Lisp. We could create what's called a P list, which is going to use symbols to describe the data that is inside of them. And how you do that is define variable like this. We could say something like Superman, and then we could say list. And here is the key that's going to provide information on the data stored. So Superman's going to be his public name and secret ID is going to be his secret identity. So Clark Kent, like that. Let's then go and create another list, which is going to hold all of our heroes. So we'll go call this hero list, give it a value of nil to start off. We could then add heroes to our list. So we could add Superman to our hero list just that easily. And then if we wanted to cycle through all these different guys, we could do do list and hero which is going to be the temporary holding cell for all the different heroes that are popped off of this. There's only going to be one of them though, because that's what I got. And another thing that's kind of cool is we can have all of this data automatically output in the right way from the list. Of course, put the parentheses inside of there for format. And how we would do that is by putting a tilde in that parentheses right there. Tilde A, we're going to be getting Superman and Clark Kent. And then we'll go and get the next one. A and then close it with tilde and the closing curly brackets and then we can pass in hero right like that if you cycle through you're gonna see Superman secret identity automatically pops out there on the screen so if you didn't catch that exactly what's going on it's cycling through hero each of the items in the hero list and it's automatically because I have this tilde and the curly brace and this tilde and this closing curly brace it's grabbing Superman out of there automatically for me so I didn't have to say I want specifically the name and then Clark Kent directly out of there and putting that inside of there so that's another neat little trick way to cycle through all this different stuff and that is a lot of information on lists but now let's go and take a look at association lists because they're kind of cool as well and all the neat little things we'll be able to do with those Basically, let's go in here and we'll say define parameter and we're going to call this heroes. Now what we're going to be able to do is go and put Superman inside of here and then Clark Kent inside of there and add in a couple other different heroes. Now we'll be able to go in and go something like Superman data and grab specific data out of that list by using associate and here we'll go Superman and then heroes. So that's going to allow us to grab from the heroes associated list information that's specific to Superman. And you can see there is the Superman data, Superman and Clark Kent automatically pop out there for us. So we're able to associate those two guys with each other. And because this data is actually stored as a list, we're actually going to be able to use our little tools here, our CARs and CADRs and da 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 da. So we can go and get this list data right here, which is going to be returned from the association right here and automatically get just Superman's secret identity printed out on the screen. Superman is Clark Kent. We can do other things with association lists. Let's go and create another one. This time we're going to be storing different pieces of data about our different heroes inside of this list. And then once again, if we wanted to come in here and get Superman's data, like in this situation, we wanted to be able to find out the height of our superhero. Well, again, CIDR, if you don't remember how this works, we don't want Superman. We want to get this data right here and then we want to specifically get the height so we have D and A right like that and you can see that we were able to pull the Superman height directly right out of that list and I'll put it here on the screen and work with it. So there's a brief explanation of association lists and lists and so forth and so on. Now why don't we go and take a break and look at some simpler things like functions. 
Okay, so functions inside of a list, we've already gone over this a little bit, but what the heck, let's do it a little bit more. If we wanted to define a function, just type in D-E-F-U-N, and let's say we would just want to do a really simple thing like this. And then we could put a whole bunch of functions inside of our functions, of course. And then if we wanted to go and put in a new line in that situation, hear about that all the time. It's the only reason why I keep bringing it up. And then if we wanted to execute our function, and there we go. Hello. Popped out on the screen. Really simple. Now let's do something a little bit more complicated. So again, let's define a brand new function. And this one's going to get an average of two values that are passed inside of it. Of course, we just put the attributes that we expect to be passed inside of it, like this. We would just do a division right there, and then we would add up our different numbers that we have inside of there. And then finally put the two right there, close that off. And then we could go in here and just call our function inside of this format like this. And there you can see that works. There are so many things you can do inside of Lisp with functions. We could also define some of our parameters as being optional inside of our function. Very easy. So create another function. Let's have this one be print list. And then we'll just have wx. And then anything we want to be optional, we would just put optional before it with that and sign. And then we could continue putting in additional different values inside of here. And then we could have these all output on our screen. And then call our function print list, just like we have been. And in this situation, we're only going to pass in three values. You're going to see exactly what it does. It automatically goes and gives the last value a default value of nil. Could also set it up so we'll be able to receive multiple values. We'll define a variable. And we're going to call this total. Give it a default value of zero. And now we can come in and define our function function and let's call it sum and with rest you're going to be able to receive multiple values and I'm just going to call this nums. Now inside of here we'll then be able to go do list num nums going to sort through all the list items. Guess what this does? The rest turns nums into a list and as it's sorting through it's temporarily going to hold each inter iteration of the nums list inside of the variable named num. And then we could set the value of total by adding num to total each time we go through there. And then we could close off the do list part right there. And we could do something like sum is equal to, and then the final value of total. And then whenever we wanted to call this, we could just go as far as we wanted to go and know that it's automatically going to be able to handle all those different values. We're also going to be able to use keywords and what are called keyword parameters so that we'll be able to pass values to specific parameter names inside of here and we'll just call this print list again and we could do we can also stack these guys up so we, let's say we wanted to make everything optional we could do that and then let's also say we wanted to have key values so y and z like this and there is our list and a new line and then we just go list x y and z and now we could call print list again using optionals as well as keys. If we want to give a value specifically to the x value, just put a little colon x and the value you want assigned. And then if you wanted to assign a value to y, you could do that as well, right like this. And you can see that that automatically works as well. Now defaults by default are going to return the value of the last expression that's executed. So this is actually what would be considered the return value. However, you could also return a specific value with something called return from followed by the function's name. Just make sure you remember you always want to put return from and whatever the function's name is. So let's have this be difference and it's going to get number one and number two. And then if we wanted to return a value, we would say return from and then the function's name difference. This guy right here is going to go right there. And then inside of it, we could just do a simple subtraction. So num1, num2, and then just call difference 10 and 2. Or better yet, let's just throw this inside of a format statement like that. And there you can see exactly how that works. Now let's take a look back here at association lists and functions. I'm going to just want to talk about something called quasi-quoting, which is going to allow us to switch from what is called code to data mode. And this is kind of cool. So what we're going to be able to do here is define a function and let's say get hero data is the name of our function and size is what's going to be passed inside of this. What we're going to be able to do is go format, but then we're going to be able to go in here and pull in specific hero data. We're basically going to be able to 
switch back and forth between data versus code mode. So we'll be able to execute code and put the code right in the middle of the data. It's really neat. So I'm going to go down the new line so we can see everything on one line. So here we go. So this is going to be quasi quoting mode. And then if we want to convert something into actual code so that we can run this code inside of this actual data, say we can just put C A A R inside of here and size is and again we want to run a function again inside of this data really cool we can do that and again we're going to run another function inside of here c d d a r size now what we'll be able to do is come in and go get hero data and pass in hero size and you can see that it pops back superman is six foot three inches and 230 pounds so just another neat little thing you can do with Lisp. You pretty much can't do with any other language. Another thing we could do is we could actually check multiple different items and run a function against them. So we could say a number and then use map car, which is going to take a list and run a function over and over and over across all the different items in the list. And the function that you want to run against those has to start with a number sign and then a quote and let's just say in this situation if we wanted to just check to if each item inside of our list is actually a number or not of course you can use any function you could imagine so let's just go f and g and you can see that it comes back true 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 nil nil so that's map car and how it works and how you can use very easy in one line go and check a whole bunch of different things inside of a list. You can also define functions local only to a specific area and you do that with something called flet. and the way this guy is going to work is you're going to have a function name inside of here and arguments that are going to be passed inside of it and then you're going to have the function body it's going to be just whatever it's going to be all that stuff and then you're going to have the body that is going to execute that function so let me just show you just wanted to sh some people get confused by this so let's go f flat and then we can go let's create a function inside of it called double it and double it's going to get a number and then what it's going to do to that number is multiply that number that it receives by two and then inside of here we're going to be able to execute it so you can put functions inside of functions you could also come in here and have multiple functions inside of flet so let's get rid of that right there and then we'll put another one inside of here which will be triplet which is also going to receive a number and then inside of that we could define exactly what it's going to do so it's going to get the number that's passed in and multiply that times three and then close that off with three parentheses and then we could do something with double and triple ten and then we could do triple it and what the heck we could also go and double it so pass the value of double it into triple it and then pass a ten inside of that and then let's get rid of that so you can play around with that a little bit uh, another thing is we can use labels and they're used whenever you want to have a function call itself or if you want to be able to call another local function inside of a function I'm covering pretty much everything here so let's go uh, labels and you could go double it and there's a number that's passed inside of it and then you can define what you want double it to do multiply num times two and then triple it also receives a number and then of course you could throw double it with its num and then multiply that times three i mean i'm just playing around here this is definitely something you guys want homework all the time go in here and just play around with these guys experiment and check around you know check out exactly what's going on and understand exactly what's going on there's your homework and then you could go triple it directly inside of here, which is kind of cool. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of different things we can use function-wise. And when we go look at a couple more, we're also going to be able to return multiple values from a function. And how we do that is, let's say we have something called squares. I don't know, I'm just making this up as I go along here. And if we want to return a value, we would go values and then define the different values we want to return. So we'll put this to the two and then we could also return exponent num and three and then we could get multiple values from the function of course so let's go multiple value bind put a and b here a and b and then call squares pass two inside of there we can go and get those two values from there and those two values of course are going to be a and b and you can see they output right there on the screen so it's kind of cool passing multiple values getting multiple values and using functions inside of functions just a whole bunch of craziness
All right, so now let's talk about higher order functions. And basically with these, you're going to be able to use functions as if they are data. So let's come in and just define a function. Let's call it times three. And basically it's going to receive a value and then it's going to multiply that value times three. Pretty simple. And then let's go and create another one. And this one's just going to be times four. And you guessed it, it's gonna multiply whatever it gets times four. Now basically what this is gonna allow us to do is pass in the function without any attributes, just like it's a variable. So let's create another function. And this is gonna be, I'm gonna call this multiples. And here is going to be the function that's gonna be passed inside of it. So let's call this multiple function. So one of these guys is gonna actually get passed into this function. And let's say we wanted to go and automatically multiply a list of numbers up to this maximum number times three and times four. And you can totally change the way this function works based off of the function that you pass inside of it because it's really powerful. So let's use do times again. And here we're gonna say x max num. And now what we're gonna be able to do is go format T and cycle through all these different items up to that maximum number. And we can go and output all the different values here so it'll be easy to see what we're multiplying times. And then we're gonna take X. So X is gonna go right here. And then if we want to use our custom function, we call fun call like that. And the function that we want to execute and the value we want to pass into that function. So this guy, one of these guys is gonna be passed inside of here and X is gonna be this guy. So as it's cycling through here, it's temporarily going to get this value stored right there. So it's gonna pass that into that function and then it's going to print that out on the screen. Now what we're gonna be able to do is go multiples and then if we wanna pass in our function, we have to put a dollar sign and that quote right there and times three and then the maximum value we want it to print out or print up to. And then of course we're gonna do the same thing for four just to show you that it both works seamlessly. And there you can see it did. Went in here, multiplied everything times three, and then down here, multiply everything times four. There you can see, that's how we use higher order functions. And then pretty much the last type of function we're gonna talk about are lambdas. And basically it's gonna allow you to create a function without giving it a name. And you're also gonna be able to pass this function just like you pass variables. So let's use map car again, cause map car is kind of cool. Again, allows you to cycle through a list and perform a function on it. So to call it, we'll just go lambda and it's gonna get a value of X and it's going to multiply everything are all x values times two. And then let's go and create ourselves a list. There we go, and there we are. We just created a lambda function. And just so you can see how it actually does something, let's go and throw print inside of here, and that like that. And there you can see it printed out all those different values on the screen. That's a brief explanation of how lambdas work, but I think because I've talked so much about functions in general, you'll be able to get it. So why don't we talk about macros? Now basically a function runs whenever it's going to be called to execute, while a macro is compiled. And then after it's gonna be compiled, it's going to be available immediately like any Lisp built-in functions. And it might help to better understand macros in regards to they are used to generate code rather than necessarily perform actions. Now to explain them a little bit better, what I'm basically going to do is just create a couple macros that solve some problems. So let's say we have variables here. We have num, and then let's go and have num2. Give it a value of zero. So now I'm gonna change something that's a little bit irritating. Whenever we're working with if statement, it sometimes is kind of irritating to have to use prog n if we wanna be able to execute multiple different functions inside of here if this comes back as true. And one way that we can solve this, or at least one canned way that I'm going to force uh, macros to solve it, is I'm gonna create a macro that is gonna fix that. Now to find a macro, we just go define macro, exactly like that. And I'm gonna call this if it. Now what it's gonna do is if it, our if it function is gonna get a condition passed to it, and then it's gonna get a list of statements that we are going to store. We're going to use rest for that as well, and that's going to be the body of the function that we're going to be working with here. So we have a condition, and then all the statements that we want to execute. Here are going to be those statements right there. Now in this situation, I'm gonna use quasi-coding again, which is going to be this backspace right there, that quote right there, and this is gonna generate all the code. 
Remember I said macros generate code. So the code that this is going to generate is if, and then we're going to follow this with the condition. And then inside of it, we can put prog n. And then the body of the statements that are passed inside of here, we're going to put this comma right here to automatically turn this from data into code mode, just like we did before. And how we're going to get that is type in body like that with the at symbol. And then we could do something like format. This would be the else part of it. Can't drive like that. And then we're going to close that off. And there we define a macro. So basically it's just going to change the way that the if is going to work. It's going to have the if, it's going to have a condition, it's going to take prog, it's going to get all the statements and put them inside of the prog block, and then it's going to use this as else otherwise. So now let's go and use it. So we could do something like set age equal to 16. And what this is going to allow us to do now is use our new if it function. We're going to be able to pass in or check if the age is greater than or equal to 16. And now we can completely forget about using prog in in this situation and just go you are over 16 and then print time to drive. And then we could throw in a new line like that. And you can see here if we execute it, you are over 16 and it's time to drive automatically prints out. So that's how we can create a macro. Let's go and create another one maybe to clear some things up here a little bit more. Now let is something else that is or can be a little bit confusing or irritating with all its parentheses. So let's go and have num1 and num2 and show if we wanted to add all of these together, we'd have to go let sum and then add together num1 that's passed in and num2 that's passed in and then format and then go num1, num2, and sum. So instead of using let in this situation, what I'm going to do instead is define a macro to clean it up. So I'm going to go to define macro. I'm going to call this let x and it's going to get two values passed inside of here. Again, it's going to have the body section. Let's have this be rest. Sorry about that. Body section and then inside of here define exactly what we're trying to build. So we're going to put let inside of here, which is what we want to show. And then we're going to put in those double parentheses right here so we can get rid of them whenever we're working with our code. And we'll put our variable here, and the second variable value here, and then the body will then follow afterwards like that. Now what we're going to be able to do with our, let's go and create another function. Let's call it subtract num1 and num2. And now we'll be able to use let x to define the value for diff right here without all those quotes because that's exactly what let's doing. It's basically taking this value right here and assigning it to this variable right here. So in this situation we got rid of all those quotes and we're going to be assigning this value right here to this variable right there. And then we can use exactly the same format statement here except instead we're going to put diff inside of here instead of sum and change that to a minus sign. And now what we'll be able to do is go subtract 10 and 6 and you can see that that automatically worked and it's a little bit cleaner looking and those are just some you know just common things that we use macros for just wanted to give you a couple examples again go in play with this stuff and you'll get better and better and better so now a lot of people don't realize that Lisp actually can be used to create classes and to create a class inside of here we call, we call define class and let's go and create one called animal and what we're going to do next is we're just going to define the different attributes we want for our animal class so we want our animal class to have a name and a sound we can then come in here and define an animal object let's call this dog and then to actually create it we call make instance and then animal we define the type of object we want to create now if we want to set the values for our new dog object we go set f and we go slot value these are slots and dog is what we want to change and name specifically is what we want to change and in this situation let's call our dog object spot we're then going to do the same thing pretty much for sound and so if we want to change this to sound and then we want to change this to wolf there you go that's how we can set as well as create dog objects you then want to get the values from that dog object pretty simple say something like says and then to pass in those slot values we just go slot value the object's name dog and then the specific 
thing we want to get out of it and then we could do the same thing for sound of course so there we are just change this to sound and then of course close that off and you can see spot says wolf you're also going to be able to define the initialization so that it's a lot more complex than this where there's basically nothing being defined right there and how we're going to do that with is with a whole bunch of different keys so let's define a brand new class find class make this one a little bit more complicated and this one i'm going to call mammal i'm going to do it in pretty much the same exact way here we'll define name and then here i'm going to define the key that i want to use to assign to this slot and that's going to be name i could then come in and define that i definitely want a value if you ever create an instance of mammal i definitely must have a value provided for the name slot otherwise i want to show an error and i can put anything in here so i could say must provide a name whenever we're creating that and then close that off show you a couple other different things we can do as well and for sound again we want the key to be associated with this to be called sound we could also come in and define a default value for our all of our sounds and let's say that we want that to be no sound and that's how we would do that and we could also come in and have things called getters and setters automatically generated by going this is going to be the way we're going to get and set is this guy right here but by putting accessor inside of there you're going to automatically generate getters and setters so you can change the value for sound and do the same thing for name of course and if you would only want them to be able to get or read the value you would put reader inside of there if you would only want them to be able to set you would type in writer but for the most part you're going to use accessor and those are ways that you can expand on initializing your class now what we're going to be able to do is come in and define a parameter and let's call this guy king kong and we're going to make an instance of the mammal so we're going to say mammal and then we're going to define the name which of course is going to be king kong that's how that's where the name part this start right, right here comes in and then we're going to define the sound in the same exact way so sound and let's say we want this to be whatever and there we go and that's how we can initialize with all of these other nice little tricks we have and of course we're going to be able to output all this information on the screen king kong says roar as you can see right there of course if we would have came in here and tried to create a king kong mammal without providing a name it would have print this error out on our screen and you could go and test that and try it out just to make sure let's go and create another mammal and let's call this guy fluffy again you're going to do pretty much exactly the same thing as we did here with king kong except this is going to be called fluffy instead and we're going to have him say meow. We'll do a couple more things with Fluffy. And you're basically going to have things called generic functions, which are going to have a name and a parameter list, but no implementation. And the reason for this is because in Lisp, methods don't belong to classes, but instead belong to generic functions, which are responsible for executing the correct method based on the data that was passed. As you're going to see here, let's say, let's define a generic function, define generic, and let's have this be make sound like that and it's going to be passed a mammal now what we need to do is define a method for that and we'll call this make sound of course because that's what the generic has right here then inside of this we're going to have the mammal which is actually going to be the value or the name that the uh, mammal object is going to get inside of our method and then we need to define what type of object it is it's a mammal and now we could come in here and do pretty much what we had right here so let's just copy that paste that in there except in this situation now we're going to be able to accept any mammal and that's where the mammal part right here comes from that right there and there we go we can pass that in there and now what we're going to be able to do is no matter what object type we're using or whatever object it is we can call make sound and call king kong like that or we could call make sound on fluffy and know that both of those will work oh, and i just forgot to put this one parentheses there there we go no big deal and now i can see king kong says roar right here and fluffy says meow right there another thing we were talking about how we were able to set and get values we'd also be able to define our own setters and getters and we're going to do that again with gen creating a generic function so define generic and here if we want to define the setter we'll go set up and let's say it's mammal name and then we would type in value 
and then it would be the mammal. This would allow us then to go in and go define a method for this setter. Set up, mammal name, value, and then inside of this we would put the mammal followed by mammal, which is the class type. And then inside of this function or this method, we could go set up, slot value, the mammal, which is going to be the object, the value that we want to set, and then the value that we want to give it. So that's how we would create that. Again, we would create a getter function in much the same way, define generic mammal name, and it's gonna be passed a mammal object. And then we'll define our method, mammal name is what the function's gonna be called, or the method's gonna be called, the mammal. Define the object type for it. And then here it's gonna be slot value the mammal and the name for the getter is going to be returned in that situation. What this is then going to allow us to do is come in and go set f and call mammal name like that, pass in the specific objects that we want to change the name for, and then inside of it provide the value that we want to change it to. And you can see right here, mammal name, where does that come from? Well, that comes from this guy. So that's the function we are actually calling, mammal name. And what are we doing? We're passing an object inside of it. And what is that? Mammal. It's a mammal type. And here we're going to have the value of the, the mammal and we're going to change that. Kind of straightforward. And just wrap your head around it. Just play around with it. You'll get it. And then of course we're going to be able to call mammal name again and pass in King Kong to get the getter. And you can see right there, I am Kong prints out on our screen. Now of course for the sound, class inside of here or the sound attribute or slot we said that we automatically wanted the accessors created for us and we wanted their name to be a mammal sound like that so in that situation we don't need to create the getters and setters we can just go ahead and use them and to use the automatically generated getters and setters which is what you're going to do 90 percent of the time you're just going to go mammal sound make a call to that guy and let's just have this be king kong like that and then inside of it we could give it a new sound. And then of course you'd be able to print that out on our screen, just going like this and changing this to mammal sound. And as you can see, it printed out the new roar. And pretty much the only thing that I have left here is to talk about inheritance. And basically inheritance is going to allow us to automatically inherit all the attributes of our superclass and then call methods that are going to accept the superclass. So let's just come in here and go define class and let's call this dog. If you want to inherit from the mammal class, for example, you would just put mammal right there and then you would follow that up with two open parentheses and there you go, you just created a subclass called dog of superclass type mammal. You could then come in and create a new dog type, let's call it rover and then make instance like that and you want it to be a dog type you want to define its name as rover and you want to define its sound as wolf and that's how easy that is and now you can automatically use any of the methods as well that will accept mammals just make sure you call it rover with a star and there you can see rover says wolf now let's take a look at some data structures that are available to us in lisp and let's makes a lot of sense to start off with arrays if you want to create an array you can just go create or define parameter and let's say i want one called names and then i'm going to call make array three like this there we go i made an array that's going to hold three pieces of data we can then add a value using set f and then we would just go a r e f names so i'm going to make a reference to my names array and in the first part of that array i'm going to put in a symbol called bob i can then get a value from that index as well a reference names and i can specifically get the first item in that array and i could come in here and go format t and you can see bob pops out on the screen just like that you can also make multi-dimensional arrays as well so let's say that I wanted to make a three by three array, like this, and just make array. And then inside of here, I'm gonna define that I want it to be three by three. And you can also come in and do initial contents of the array right at the initialization. So for this guy, I'm going to have this, and then it's gonna be a three by three array. So I can just, well, I wanna put a space in between each of those, and then a space between all of these as well. And six, seven, and eight. And there we go, we went and made a three by three array. And then we just wanna close all those off. 
and there that is. Of course I'm going to be able to cycle through and print out all of these and let's just use due times because that's about the easiest and so I'm going to start off with the value of x. I'm going to increment up to 3 for this and then also due times throw a y inside of there, increment up to 3 for that and then let's just use print here because that's the simplest. Array reference, number array is what I'm going to be using and then I'm going to cycle through and get the x and y index for all of those arrays. I trust that if you're watching this you probably understand indexes and how they work. Close that off like that and we could use bad styling and do that and and if we execute you can see that those all print out. So that's a basic rundown of arrays and how they work inside of Lisp. Now let's take a look at hash tables which are a collection of key valued pairs and you're going to define them in the same similar way. And here define parameter and let's say that I want one called people and to make this I go make hash table. Pretty simple. Now I'm going to be able to set the keys for these guys so I can say set up get hash and go 102 people. So I'm assigning or making reference to the hash table people here and I'm giving it this specific key right here and then I can just assign a value to it. So let's say, I'll close that off, say I want to put an item inside of here that's going to be Paul Smith added that inside of there and of course we can go and add a whole bunch more I'm gonna keep it fairly simple let's say that the next key is going to be 3 and this is going to be Sam Smith we can then get the value stored in the 102 key if we'd like and to do that we just go get hash and then we would just type in whatever the key is and then the hash table that I want to be pulling that information from. And there you can see Paul Smith pop back. And then we could also use map hash, which is going to execute a function on multiple items inside of a list like we saw before. So let's just say we want to go map hash and the we want to run a function. So we have to put a number sign and then a quote. And let's just use a lambda function here again. We're going to have keys and values for this guy and what we're going to use for our function is format t and then just to keep this simple is equal to just going to output the keys and the values associated with those keys and I can just go k and v and that's going to go inside of there and then at the end of this I can say people is going to be the list that I want to use you can refer to that meaning the hash table has any other list with map hash like that and there you can see we pop through and we got all those different guys. We could also come in and delete an item from this since I showed you how to add them. Rim hash 103 from the people hash and that would delete it. Alright so there's hash tables and arrays. Why don't we go and take a look at structs and a struct's basically a user-defined data type that's going to have multiple different data types inside of it and to define one we just go define struct and let's say we want it to be called customer and then we say we want each of these to have a name an address and an ID there you go you just created a struct we're gonna be able to store data inside of there quite easily just set Q give it a name so let's say we want it to be called Paul Smith no, Paul Smith there we are and to make one we go make customer and it knows what you're referring to and then you use the different keys to assign different values to this struct that we're working with. So we have name, address, and one, two, three, main. And then finally, let's give it an ID of 1000, and then we can close that off. Oh, get rid of that right there. That's the reason why that went that way. And there we go. So there we went and put data or created a custom struct. We can get a value stored inside of this as well, just by coming in here and saying customer name and then pass in a specific one, which is going to be Paul Smith, like that. Oh, make sure that you have this closing quote right here, Paul Smith. And you can see Paul Smith pop back right here. And of course, we're also going to be able to come in here and change the value in a struct. And we're just going to go set F and we'll go customer address if you decided that this guy moved. So Paul Smith. And then we just go 125 main instead. And there we go. And we could also go in and go write Paul Smith. And you can see another different way that we can output the information in the struct on a screen. There's so many, there's so many different functions that are built into Lisp, it's unbelievable. And we could also come in here and make a struct. Let's say we want to go Sally Smith 
and put a special ID inside of here just for the heck of it and make customer like that and then we come in and go name Sally Smith pretty easy and she has an address and let's have this be 126 main and then give it the ID of the ID that we put inside of there and then close that off and of course you could come in and print all that stuff out in exactly the same way and basically the only thing I haven't covered here is file IO if you wanted to write some piece of information to a text file you would just go with open file and you would type in my stream you're going to then define inside of here the text file that you want to write to and if it hasn't been created it will be created for you as long as you have permission of course and we define the direction which is going to be output we're going to output to the file and then if it exists we're going to say super seed in this situation there's a whole bunch of different things you can do here with output and i'm just providing the basics here so that means it's just going to overwrite anything that's in that file and then for example we could come in here and print something to it as well with print c some random text and write it to my stream and there we go that's how we could write to it and then we could go and read data from it just go let and we'll say in and we'll say open and we'll define the file that we want to read from we can say if does not exist well then nil you can see those all closed off and when in does have some values inside of it we're going to say that we want to loop for line is equal to and then we can read all that data out of there by using read line until there's nothing left or nil which is basically what that means and then while there is data from this that's going to be coming out to us we want to say format and let's say that we want to print all that information out to the screen all those lines of text that are being read from that text file are going to be stored inside of a line they're going to be printed out for us and then after we don't have anything left we will close the input stream and then we will close everything else and you can see we run that ah, I was being silly and wrote write open file I instead want that to be with open file yeah, it's a long tutorial and I also want to make sure I put a little parentheses right here after supersede sorry about that and if I run it you can see some random text gets printed out so there you go guys there is a heck of a lot of information about Lisp hopefully I covered everything that you would ever want to know about Lisp and if I didn't Please leave your questions and comments below. Otherwise, till next time.